superstitious or cowardly or weak, but I'll never play a character whose name one dare not speak. <laughs> Hamlet in Dublin and Holmes or either of the Dromeos, but sorry, I won't play Mackers. I'll play Richard the Third with a hump and a wing or Henry the Eighth, that selfish pig, but sorry, I don't do Mackers. Every soul that plays this role, Miss Finger, or death, I'd rather sweep the bloody stage than ever do Mackers. So give me me clear, clear mantra, Romeo Juliet doesn't matter. I'll play them all. Welcome back to the Slings and Arrows Rewatch Podcast. We are watching uh, the Canadian television series uh, Slings and Arrows for our rewatch this summer. Um, and this is the second episode of our four episodes, uh, our four episode podcast. And this is for season two of the show. Um, now, our next episode will be airing July 26th. Um, again, every episode airs Thursdays at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time and is always on uh, pressplus1.com, www.press plus one dot com um, and again we really would love to hear your feedback and your thoughts and your comments so let us know uh, we record these every Sunday so if you can get your thoughts and your feedback in before uh, the Sunday so the Thursday to the Sunday uh, drop us a line and let us know what you think um, either of the show or any of our our commentary on the show uh, we'd love to hear it um, so you can leave comments for this episode uh, season two episode on the season two episode comment uh, comment section on press plus one, or um, or maybe leave some thoughts for the season three uh, episode coming up that we will be airing again July twenty six. So we are going to kick this off um, by Aaron Bala, my co host. Say hi, Aaron. Hi again. Um, doing an overview of, uh, of season two. Uh, I'm Kinda Mardambe. I'm the publisher of Press Plus One. And uh, yeah, take it away, Aaron. So this season, the New Burbage Theatre Company is doing a production of Macbeth, believed to be the hardest play to stage. Artistic director Jeffrey Tennant takes his inspiration from Oliver, who was the director last season, who died in the first episode, who had tried unsuccessfully to do a production, but had taken boxes worth of notes. But by using his notes, Jeffrey invites Oliver's ghost to return to his visions. Now, also this season, Jeffrey clashes heavily with Henry Breedlove, who's a talented actor that Oliver always wanted to play Macbeth. Now, Henry's done the play successfully three times and resists any change to his performance. Ellen, who's uh, Jeffrey's girlfriend at the time, I'll mention a little more about that later, she worries, however, when she sees Jeffrey talking to Oliver about the stage direction, which to her looks like he's talking to himself. And that kind of causes her to side with Henry's vision of the play. Eventually, Jeffrey is forced to fire Henry for his insubordination and put his understudy in a preview. The preview goes well, and Henry's reluctantly encouraged to accept the role again, but he still vows to do it his way. For opening night, Jeffrey decides to pull some switches on him, but boasts that an actor as well-versed as him can handle it. Henry is furious, but the show must go on, which results in an infamous scene where Macbeth is naked on stage. Now, Jeffrey finds the action humanizing of the character, but, understandably, it makes Henry extremely uncomfortable to have this sprung upon him. Henry decks Jeffrey, but is convinced by the audience's enthusiastic applause that the performance worked amazingly with all of Jeffrey's machinations. Elsewhere at the festival, festival director Richard finds that the festival's out of money. He's able to convince the Minister of Culture for a loan to rebrand the festival and bring in younger viewers. So Richard goes to a unique advertising agency headed by the Eastern influence Sanjay, that sets up numerous billboards around town, advertising the festival ironically with photos of dying subscribers and negative reviews the festival's received. The higher-ups are furious about this rebranding campaign with their current subscribers cancelling, and Richard himself struggles to believe in it, but every time he tries to change the direction, Sanjay's able to make him see the light. This works well enough until the police arrive at Richard's door to ask if he's, he's, if he's seen Sanjay, who it turns out is an escaped convict working under an assumed name. Richard is distraught and depressed, and there's much talk of him getting fired, but on the day of the opening performance, the youth have arrived, and the show actually sells out, redeeming Richard and netting him a possible promotion. 
Now, there's a few other subplots this season. Uh, Ellen gets engaged to Sloan from last season for about an episode, and then they break up. She shacks up with Jeffrey for a while, but they can't handle it and break up too. She gets audited and ends up owing close to $30,000 in back taxes and sleeps with her brother-in-law. So her life's kind of a mess. But she does get back with Jeffrey in the end, so I'm sure it's going to be okay. Uh, Anna, the assistant, also gets herself a love interest in a playwright who fancies her. But he also does seem to be using her for story ideas. Uh, and our personal favorite, famed director Darren Nichols, comes back to direct a performance of Romeo and Juliet, in which he creates the most sterile, oddball version possible, with the characters dressed as futuristic chess pieces. Jeffrey, however, manipulates him into having a change of heart and creating more human performance. But we also get a nice little love story uh, in the season with them, with the, uh, the production as the two leads, Sarah and Patrick, who play Romeo and Juliet, end up falling in love despite being in like the worst possible version of Romeo and Juliet you can make. And that's your season two overview. Very well said there, Aaron. Very well said. Um, yeah, uh, just again, I'm just going to say the name just because it makes me shake my head. Darren Nichols. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the highlights um, of the season. Uh, what, what, first of all, I want, I want to kind of put it out there that I've seen the three seasons now and this is my favorite season. Really? Hmm. Yeah, not just for the uh for the the fact that I love Macbeth um but I really enjoyed how the whole season played with sanity and insanity and what makes us sane and what makes us crazy and and I see that this plays on quite a few levels um I I I see how people are quite duplicitous towards Jeffrey's craziness or you know him speaking to Oliver um and yet they will do things that you clearly feel are 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 crazy within their own lives and they have perfectly reasonable explanations um and a lot of this does come between uh between Ellen and Jeffrey uh this this kind of attitude but um but yeah so this this to me was was a a standout season um uh, so what were some of the things that uh, that you enjoyed about this, Aaron? Um, I think for me, one of the highlights was uh, Richard being unhinged. I know you mentioned in the last podcast how Richard was, was your favorite character. Uh, and I think they just, they took him and ran with him this season. He was great. Just kind of, uh, I guess, being on the edge of sanity. He was just, he's broke and he's desperate. And he was just hilarious being in that space. I, I loved that performance. I thought it was was great this season, the entire season long. He's emotionally emotionally pliable, I would say. I mean, he is so open to suggestion. And when I saw Sanjay like manipulating him and him just going for anything, and then and then when Sanjay's like, you know, you know, play the clarinet and calm yourself down and you see him in his office playing his clarinet like a horribly, I might add, playing it horribly. Yeah. But just like, you know, the minion he's born to be, you know. Yeah, I love that. And I loved uh, actually Com Fiore playing Sanjay. I am a huge fan of Com Fiore, but I'm used to seeing him mainly as a dramatic actor. I think the last time I would have seen him might have been the Borgias over on Showtime or Showcase. And uh, I think he's the villain in that show. And uh, here I am seeing him, and he's being funny, and I love seeing Com Fiore being funny. I think I'm the head of the Com Fiore fan club, so it was great to see him this season for me. I love how opposite we are on everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Team Paul Gross. You're like, boo. I'm like, I love Hamlet. You you like A Midsummer Night's Dream, boo. You know, I'm not a fan of Com Fiore. Oh, break my heart. I think he's okay, but I think there's a lot of extra hype there that's completely unnecessary. Anyway, so that's my own personal opinion on it, but I did actually think his his performance of Sanjay was probably the best I've ever seen him do, um, being completely arrogant and pompous and a crook at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And really one of our best moments came between him and Richard in the jail. Oh, yes. When Richard tries to strangle him, <laughs> I thought that was so funny. And, and just his whole movement, the way he, like, he bolts across the table for him, I just, I thought that was beautiful. <laughs> I also really liked the version of Macbeth we see. I know I kind of harped on it last uh, podcast with the first season with all the, 
the actors in, in modern dress. And, I mean, they did it again this season because we do see modern-day soldiers uh, as they do their production of Macbeth. And I thought it really worked this season. I think maybe it was the last one. I think they were just too casual. Maybe that was it. They were, they were modern casual. And I think modern kind of fitting the role, I think that, that worked really well for me. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think I just like to, you know, add on that the fact that the way the the performances are staged within a television show, I think is beautifully done. I, I think that would have been one of the harder things to actualize. Like, how do we make this play part of the season without making it be like, you know, a, a stage play on theater on on television. Like, how how do we how, how do we make that more entertaining? And I just find the way they put the the, the Macbeth throughout the story, like you know, um, you know, within you you get like these little moments of scenes, and I don't know. I just I I find it really well done. I don't know if it's if I was completely unfamiliar with Macbeth whether I would get it or not. Mm-hmm. But I know for somebody who who knows Macbeth, I, I really like the way that it was put together, pieced together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Macbeth, it, it might also be one of my other favorite uh, Shakespearean plays. And uh, no, I, I really liked how they did it here. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, but even when they do Lear in the next season and then the first season Hamlet, like, you know, when we first meet Jeffrey and he's, you know, he's doing a scene from The Tempest um, in that, that theater company that he no longer cares about. <laughs> you know, you see some of the characters in the, in the background and you see the storm and I don't know, they're just, there's something very, there's something very um, mood evoking about the way that they stage these but it's not it's not like a dry run of of watching you know Macbeth or Hamlet or whatever on stage I was gonna ask did you find Jeffrey a little more restrained this season what I loved about this this season with Jeffrey is that he he's he's trying to pretend to be normal so that people don't like you know, I think he cares more that that people are are have their eyes on him and and that he has he feels that sense of pressure of of doing the right thing and being the right person for for being an artistic director of you know a major Shakespearean festival. You know, then you see him off ranting with Oliver and 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 this conversation he has with Oliver about Macbeth and really all I keep seeing and I keep waiting for that moment when he's like, you know what, sod it, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to, you know, and, and that to me was the magical moment because he was trying so hard to be what everybody else wanted him to be. And then when he turned around and he said, you know what, my my Macbeth, my version, you know, you're not going to like it. Although, <laughs> again, another one of my favorite moments of the season was when Oliver was playing the ghost. Oh, man, yeah. And he just kind of came across like Frankenstein or something with all this blood dripping down. See, I think I, I well, I definitely like Jeffrey's version of that without, uh, where you don't see anyone in the chair. So I, I liked that kind of symbolism you highlighted before, kind of, of of everyone retaining their sanity and how it looked. And and no, I think, I think you're right. It is maybe a little more restrained, but for a reason. He is trying to act more like he's in control, more like he is the artistic director that everyone is looking at. And you're right, there are a few moments this season where he does kind of yell to no one and everyone sees him going crazy. And, um, yeah, no, uh, Oliver, I, I felt sad for Oliver at the end of the season. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I don't feel like Oliver, Oliver has such a strong presence in this season. And I, I felt like, because a lot of the time you see the conversations happening, it is, you know, it, we're, 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 seeing it from other people's perspective so we're no longer seeing it from Jeffrey's perspective we're seeing it from outsiders perspective so quite rarely do you see you know uh, Oliver and Jeffrey going at it and when they do it's more it's more like Oliver just has this mandate that Macbeth has to be one way so it's not not particularly character development Mm -hmm. no I think you're right I think first season was more Jeffrey you know this should be better and they were more of one mind I think here you're right they do seem to differ between each other one of them has to be right and I don't know if he if they make a better play together because of it or if in the end Jeffrey just wins in the end really this whole this whole um relationship with Ellen and Mr you know is it Henry Breedlove 
But um, I, I, like I've seen Grant Wynn Davies at Stratford many times, and um, he he's one of my favorite actors at Stratford, and uh, and just to see him playing this kind of very small person, you know, this very um, petty person, and then and then when Jeffrey fires him, um, that was just sweet honey. That was so delicious. That was one of the best firings I think I've ever seen. But then he, but then he had to eat massive humble pie and and apologize to uh, to Henry. Uh, Did you feel like he apologized? I felt like that was the childhood. Yeah, I'm sorry because this person's telling me I should be sorry. I don't think he really meant it. I didn't didn't feel like it. No, I don't think he meant it. But I think he he knew it was a necessary evil to get Henry back. But then, of course, he does get one over on Henry because he messes with his performance of of Macbeth and he keeps him on his feet. Mm -hmm. But did you notice that also Jeffrey's humiliation by having to apologize to Henry was also back to back with Anna's humiliation of having that reading uh, where she's where basically her life story is is uh, being performed. Yeah, I uh, I don't know how much I love that uh, all of that Lionel stuff. Lionel being her her bo playwright boyfriend. I mean, I was happy she got more screen time and got to see more of a character from her. But man, I I was not a fan of Lionel. Yeah, well, do you know who Lionel is? No, I don't think I do. I had actually a hard time recognizing him, but I don't know if you've ever seen Anne of Green Gables. Okay. But he, his name's Jonathan Crombie. He's an actor, but he's Gilbert Blythe in in uh, in Anne of Green Gables, which is basically the love of her life. And they start off on a on a wrong footing, and they eventually get married and they get together. And anybody of my generation is like, "Oh my God, it's Gilbert Blythe!" Like we have this little, you know, innate crush on on uh, you know on this sweetheart of uh, of Anne's from you know when she was a young girl all the way through her life. So I saw him and I was surprised I didn't really recognize him. But when I, I looked him up on IMDb, I was like, oh, it's Gilbert Blythe. So I had a bit of a hard time coming to terms with the fact that he wasn't a stand-up guy. <laughs> ah. That's not a Gilbert thing to do. That's so disturbing. So um, I didn't love it. I agree with you. I actually feel like it's maybe something that was well worth addressing, which is how much is creative license and how much is um is uh is you know uh, stealing somebody's life story um and you know within canadian productions um at these festivals at, particularly at the stratford festival sometimes you do look at them and you think like you know that director knew that that writer knew somebody who was that person you know because it's so so specifically canadian or so accurately um, of a particular generation. So, you, yeah, I can, I can understand the exploration, but really, Anna, for me, was the absolute best in the first few season, uh, first few episodes of this season, um, where she's, she's trying to hold it all together, and, and she, when she's, um, when she's over the, uh, the printer, do you remember that bit? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, and she's like, She's like, don't touch anything or I'll cry. <laughs> I just, there were a few things like that that she did that just had me howling with laughter. Um, and, you know, it was that, it was those moments that I was really loving. But when it got to her relationship with Lionel, you know, all by it, the sex scene in the dark, which was very funny. Um, I thought... I agree with you. It, it, was, uh, it, was a hard, it was a harder relationship to to deal with yeah i think um on that note i might even want to say sarah and patrick i um it weirded me out a little bit and uh, i i put it under my low light but um uh this is the second season in a row where a gay character has gone straight and it weirds me out a little bit there is something you're that's an interesting point you make and and i have to agree with you it's perhaps i i agree with you like what is going on with that something in the water Joanne Kelly, um, who plays Sarah, who is in Warehouse 13 now. Oh. Yeah, she played uh, 
Juliet. I thought she was fantastic. Oh, I agree. She she was she nailed it. She she brought a lot of heart and a lot of spirit and character to Juliet and and her character Sarah. I thought she was. And I'm like, why have we not seen more of this this woman around? I just I thought there was just something incredible about her on screen. And and David Alpe, who's who's Patrick, who's Romeo. He's in the Borges and. He's in other th- other Canadian productions too, and I must admit that you know it's hard not to be a fan of him because he's completely gorgeous. But aside from that, I didn't think it was a strong performance. Yeah, I thought he was a little almost sleepwalking when he wasn't in love, and when he was in love, he was like a hundred percent. I've never seen any other person in my life. I only have eyes for you. Yeah, I didn't buy it. I didn't like it. I didn't think it was funny. Um, I don't know. The only thing I really liked was at the end where they are in that sterile. Oh my gosh. That was the ugliest thing I've seen in my life. Futuristic chess pieces. That's what I I wrote in my notes. Yeah. Compliments of Darren Nichols. (laughs) And then they were trying to kiss each other. I thought that was adorable. But again, like, you know, I don't know. They just keep turning straight and it does seem a little uh, weirdy. How did you find relationship like Ellen with with Jeffrey, that whole love triangle and, and Henry and all that? I liked Ellen with Jeffrey and I know Sloane mentions it in the uh, last episode of the season like why aren't you guys together? You're meant to be together. And I thought his speech was a little too on the nose but yeah I liked them together. They worked well together and I think this season we got to see more of Ellen And we do realize that, yeah, she's kind of a wreck. And maybe that's why she's not with Jeffrey like she's supposed to be. But I I thought they were great together. And she just got scared when she saw that it's not just Jeffrey. Jeffrey still has a lot of demons inside of him that he has to deal with. And that's why she couldn't be with him. But then uh, the subplot with the brother-in-law weirded me out. I didn't love that, but uh, I, I'm just rooting for them to get together and stay together this time. Yeah, I agree with you. I think they worked well together, and I liked how she kind of made him breakfast in the morning. And I don't know, there was there was a synergy there, and I, I agree with you. It, it, it does seem a little bit like uh, the relate. I don't know. She just she became unhinged this season, and it, uh-huh. and it was like, how do we? How does? I, I mean, I don't particularly think she was all together there before, but I think that she had her life compartmentalized. And and now she's got this taxes thing, which to me, I actually really like that story, that plot line more because I felt like it pushed her to grow. But again, the brother-in-law thing, and then he just disappeared. This doesn't make sense to me. So um, I can see it as being, you know, a, a way of showing that she's coming unhinged, but I just, I didn't... You know, I I didn't feel like those types of things really push the story forwards. I tend to feel this a little bit with the show, that maybe they have more show than plot. Like, I think the first, the beginning of the season is always pretty good, where they kind of know where they're going with things. But I feel around the halfway mark, they start to figure out, uh uh-oh, there's more things we want to do. Or, or, sorry, we have more show than we have time things plotted out so they kind of have to throw things in there so her with her brother-in-law felt like something they threw things in there a little bit of the sarah patrick i felt were thrown in there just to kind of we have 43 minutes to fill and we only have you know 30 minutes of plot i really enjoyed the dynamic of jeffrey and henry and uh and and the play and then Jerry, I mean, you know, you remember Jerry who who, who replaces Henry uh, for Macbeth. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry killed it in, in both of his storylines. Yeah, Jerry was kind of the, the surprise front runner on this one. I thought he did a, a an exceptional job. I thought it was so endearing. I love the fact that he was thrown in at the deep end and Jeffrey helped him out along the way and it was really it was it was really the actor's nightmare that that you wanted to actually turn into you know the dream like and then and then when he and then when Macduff whispers to Jerry slash Macbeth at the end you did it man I cried I cried I was like yes Jerry did it that was so wonderful so I thought yeah that to me was I would say perhaps one of the bigger highlights of of this season was that whole relationship between Jeffrey and put it staging Macbeth and then staging it the way he wanted to do it with Jerry but just for that one night. Yeah, no, I I I really like Jeffrey. I thought I thought his little thing with his his wife kind of being on the outs but one performance as Macbeth reunites them together was a little hokey. 
But um, I liked his other stuff when he's in uh, Romeo and Juliet. I, th- I thought that stuff with him and Sarah was nice at the beginning of the season. I mean, I thought that was going to develop more, but it didn't. Um, you know, I thought that was maybe going to be like a a little bit of a, a a bigger subplot or whatever, but that didn't end up. Not that they would get together, but that he would kind of be a mentor for her or, or you know, kind of keep helping her out more. Um, and that didn't kind of come into fruition. Um um, what did you think of the Darren Nichols transformation? You know what? It was great. And I really hope I get to see him again in seasons three. I just, I, I liked him in the first season, but I think now I loved him coming to the second season or out of it. He just, oh, I loved it. He, he changed, but he didn't necessarily change for the better. And he had to change again to finally get back to normal. <laughs> um, what did you think of the Belkovsky exercise? weirded me out that's what's up with this show it's weirding me out this season i thought i liked it more but apparently my final thought is it was weird it weirded me out i felt uncomfortable at times no i uh, yeah it was weird you, i how did that i don't okay I'm, I'm clearly stumbling i don't know what to say it it's an interesting exercise and i'll believe it worked because the writers made me believe it worked I uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was visually fun. I'll agree with that. It looked a little like the the famous people players, the dark lights. Uh, that that was be solidly done. I like it the best when Darren is being his absolute biggest ass possible. <laughs> <laughs> He's wrong in in all the right ways, you know. I have a little note here in my my notes about um Richard and Richard becoming unhinged that you'd mentioned before. Um the scene where um when he goes to uh Mr. Archer's uh uh party costume party and he comes out as Cardinal Richelieu. I <laughs> I just, I howled with laughter when I saw that. It just seemed like such a, a beautifully kids in the hall moment, you know? Well, I loved how he's out there just waiting for Mitch Archer to come out. And one of the service, service people comes out and offers him a drink and, a, and an hors d'oeuvre. And of course, he immediately drops the drink and knocks it over. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that too. What were some of the the flaws of the season or the tragedies of the season for you? Um, well, I kind of mentioned my first one about the uh, the gay guys going straight. But the other one, uh, they kind of brought it up last season, and I don't think it was implemented very well, which is probably why they read it again this season, was the idea of the festival being out of money. And coming off the first season, I felt, oh, you guys are doing this again. You guys are broke again. Because I never really bought it the first season when uh, Jeffrey wants to add things to the play, I believe. And Richard's like, well, we don't have the money for it. And he's like, how do you not have money? This place screams money. And Richard had to be like, oh, everything's earmarked for other things. And I, they redid it again this season. It was better done because you could kind of buy, okay, for the whole season, uh, you're going to stretch this out. But it, it did feel a little bit of a retread. It felt a little, I, I, it, I didn't love how, Sanjay is crazy and comes up with the worst idea possible, yet somehow it still pans out for, for Richard. I didn't buy that. Yeah, I I agree with you on there's you know, that that's a that's a complex uh line of thought there that you've got going because it I mean it re- you really do see, you know, with the with the fest with any theater company, they're constantly struggling and it just seems hard to see how they're constantly struggling. Um, I don't, I don't exactly know, except for to me, and 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 there was there's a little comment in this. Uh, she's the older, ominous woman, Mora, who keeps coming up to Jeffrey and and being just ominous. Um, and and she says about it being too cold in the theater, and the other night it was too hot in the theater, and um, and I just kind of feel like sometimes. I'm Moira in that regard because I const every time I go to the theater I am frozen. I mean like we right now we're kind of living through like the hot hot summer and you know I take two or three layers with me to the theater because the so the only thing I can think of that they actually spend a ton of money on is like their their hydro bills for the air conditioning. 
I don't know what it takes to run a theater. I mean, that's to me the part I'm oblivious about. I just know that, that there are people at the theater who constantly, it's like their job to chase the money. And I understood Richard's um, upset at the fact that it's like all I ever do is chase the money and and when he goes and, and tries tries out for the musical and he sings um, you know I am the very model of a modern major general um, I, uh, I, 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 under, I understood that you know he actually he does love the theatre and it's probably why even though as a pencil pusher it's something that he he, it's like, okay, I'm a pencil pusher, but I want to be a pencil pusher in the world of theater, and I don't feel strong enough in my abilities to, to try out for it myself. Um, and But then all he ever does is he just runs after the money, and I and I do see that that's an actual problem. The uh, And everything hinges on the fact of of funding. I mean, now we're dealing with it in CBC, you know, I mean, all it, all of these major cuts that have been happening uh, to uh, to the entertainment industry in Canada, you see Telefilm has taken a huge dive and, you know, every, everybody now is having to tighten tighten their strings and figure out ways of, of getting more money in their hands to produce more content. I don't know. I just, I, I, I see, like you said, it's maybe a repeat, but I do see that that's such a prominent issue or, or concern. I do have to mention, by the way, the Minister of Arts and Culture in this is absolutely fantastic. She's one of my favorite characters. And every time Richard interacts with her, she is just hazing him. I think it, it might be interesting. I, I don't know how politically correct it it is and i say that in terms of politically true it is there we go that because they do do these cabinet shuffles and you do kind of wonder sometimes the person who's in charge now whether this is what they really want or whether they because in the uh the show originally she was supposed to be the minister of health and now she's in charge of arts and culture and she's like look at this i have to give two million dollars away think of all the polio vaccines we could make and dying children we could save and instead i have to go make someone make art and uh, it does make you wonder a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, this this is to me, this is where the question comes up. It's like, is that money, you know, d d how much merit or worth do we put in arts and entertainment? Do we value it? Do we devalue it? Um, is it at the sake of people's lives? Like, should all of the money in, in Canada from the government be allocated towards, I mean, you look in, in England, there's huge, huge subsidies for uh, theatre and theatre productions, and we've kind of taken from that template in Canada. But in America, you know, they are subsidized to a certain extent, but a lot of, you know, a lot of what they have to do in the film industry and, and the arts in general and music is they have to hustle. And if they make a product that audiences want to see, then the audiences will pay their dollar to go see it, and that's how they survive. Um, and, you know, I don't know... I don't know whether that's wholly the right thing either because then you have only blockbuster movies, you know, you don't have things that are telling interesting stories that would reach a smaller audience but would 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 enrich our cultural existence. Um but then in the same token exactly like the minister of arts and culture says it's like are we devaluate devaluing people's lives and and the, their our health and safety um so that we can go see a play i mean that's the worst way of thinking about it but it does put that question out there well i know like for my personal life growing up uh going through the tdsb the toronto district school board you did kind of especially now they're they're facing a round of cuts and uh you do see cuts and and there are i know when I went to uh, middle school, it was one of the few shop classes they still had, and because a lot of other schools just couldn't support it anymore because the funding wasn't there and a lot of money, it, you don't want to spend money on things like the arts when it's not always deemed practical or, or necessary when compared to English or math. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a shame. Uh, yes, we could spend all our money on on healthcare, and we should. But, okay, I can't land this plane. Uh, but, you know, we should also... Uh, arts are important, too. And uh, we can't live with math and English alone. I'm maybe going to throw it out there to the, re the, to the readers and listeners of the podcast. Um, 
you know, what what are your thoughts on it? You know, this this is a hot debate right now, and and is it is it worth the money that we put in to subsidize uh, the theater, or uh, you know, should we should we be having it cut down to bare bones so that it can be more of a health care? You know, that money can go towards health uh, health subsidies, or you know, like buy new new machines, like the minister uh, in in Slings and Arrow says. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Do you do you think is it art for art's sake, or or should that should that be a, a capital capital venture? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say we throw it out there to the audience. What do you think, Aaron? Sounds good. I didn't really actually think there was much weak about this season. I I enjoyed it so much. I thought there was so many funny elements of it. I I loved the struggle that Jeffrey had between uh, putting this production on in in Oliver's memory and everybody telling him that this was Oliver's play and you know he would be doing something so wonderful for you know Oliver's memory and yet in the same token how many chances do you get to do Macbeth so you know as a director so I felt like I felt like that storyline was exactly what it should be and exactly where it should have gone he he gained his own independence from what other people think by the end of that. I loved, again, as I mentioned before, how the season went from, you know, dealing with sanity and an insanity and, and kind of how, how we're, you know, how, what is, what is insane and what isn't insane and, and who decides that basically. Um, for me, the weak parts were, um, were definitely the stories between Patrick and Sarah, uh, that development. Um, uh, you know, again, another young couple, and, and I just felt it was poorly constructed. I like the idea of the old, older theatre crowd and the younger, the newcomers in. Um, I really like that. And in season three, we see a, a huge divide among the new, newer generation. And, you know, um, th- that to me was very exciting. Oh, interesting. That's that's good because as I was watching it here, I was thinking, well, you know, they they kind of mentioned a little bit, you know, you you do need to bring in the new people. But I was also thinking, well, if you do that, you're going to alienate your core base, and then who are you really? Who do you become? And no, it's it's good that they're going to bring this up again in season three because it was it was kind of resting in the back of my mind. Well, whose whose play festival is this really now? Is it a festival for young people or is it a festival for the older subscribers? Yeah, and 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 trying to have to find that that balance, and 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 feeding people's wants or feeding people's needs. It's a different it's a different construct because you have, you know, the the musicals feed people's wants, um, and you know, some like you said, a little of the Darren Nichols, you know, uh, you know, flash and excitement and stuff. But does that feed the soul necessarily? Does that take you to a higher understanding and and growth, um, where Shakespeare probably does? Anyway, um, that was to me a weak spot. Um, but I really and and I don't know whether this is so much a weakness of the season, but I was really sad to see Maria get sidelined, uh, the tech woman. Um, uh, I was kind of sad to see she's she's one of my favorite secondary characters and I I love I love her her mirth and her her anger um so I I, I lo- you know I loved in the first season where she was like you know I hate all of you people and all of your wants and all of your nagging and your whining and I just would have liked to have seen a little bit more of 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 that animosity coming out to be honest yeah, I think um, in terms of secondary characters, uh, it, uh, there was this character, Brian, this season, Brian Cabot, and I was really confused as to what they were doing with him because initially when I saw him, I thought, oh, so you're going to play Macbeth, and then uh, Jeffrey's like, no, I'm cutting you, we don't have the money for you, and he kind of just skulked around in the background for a while there, drinking at the bar. He ends up meeting up with Henry Breedlove and taking him back to see Jerry do the performance of of uh, Macbeth. But uh, that was kind of it for him. He comes in in the last scene, and I think it's left in doubt as to whether or not he can see Oliver. But uh, I don't know if that was really enough payoff for me for watching him hide out for six episodes. So it, well, he was the one. He was the one who gave Jeffrey a, a whole lot of trouble at the start. He did, yeah. At the beginning, he kind of he he tells him that he's not any good, he just kind of belittles Jeffrey. To some extent, he felt a little bit like Moira, like they were telling Jeffrey things 
on a secondary level. Um, you know, it, it wasn't such a clear perception of what they were trying to convey to him. But um, I felt like Brian was, was, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to turn around and say, you know, go from saying, you know, you're complete crap to having your eyes opened and, and, and perceiving somebody in a different light. And, and I think I agree, like Brian, I agree. He was there in the beginning and then he just like disappeared. And then he kind of came back towards the end. But I, I do kind of like the, the fact of, 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 making him a convert in a way and for him to step up to the plate it was kind of a little bit like the the old school perceptions you know I'm um, turning around and 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 you know kind of saying okay it's may have always been done this way but um but you know maybe always being done this way isn't the best way mm, okay I see what you mean there I, yeah I felt like he was speaking to Jeffrey on a different level so um, but yeah it wasn't particularly overt or very clear and and he did go for the girth of the season and it was like where did where did Brian I even forgot his name I was like who is that well where did Brian go who stole the show for you for season two well, Kinda, you will be pleased because it is your personal favorite. I think the person who stole the show this season was Richard. And what makes you think so? You know, I think every time I saw him, he was just more and more unhinged. They, they put him out there. They pushed him to the fringes of his character, and he was just hilarious. Every time I saw him, I was laughing at him. Or I was a little sad for him. But it was still, he was great to watch. He had a great arc this season. He, I, I, I even liked him at the end when he tries to audition and, uh, you know, he sings great and then he finds he has to dance and he's like, whoa, 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 what is this? And that goes horribly. I, I, I liked it. He, he was great when he was drunk. He was great when he's kind of under, under Mr. Archer's foot. He, he was just great throughout this whole season, always making me laugh. And, um, every time him and my personal favorite, Comfiore, were together, just, just loving it. Oh, you had to throw that in there, didn't you? Oh, I had to. I had to. I'm going to start raving about Paul Gross soon. <laughs> okay, I, for me, who stole the show this season was a bit of a, was it? Okay, it's a bit of a toss-up, really, um, because I actually loved Anna in this season, and I loved the comedy that came out of Anna, and um, I loved her in the first three episodes, trying to cope with everything, and um, and and just I don't know, she just had some real zingers those first first few episodes, and then this relationship with Lionel that even though it seemed to be going nowhere, like, just that dense humiliation that she was feeling uh, when he was um, was lampooning her for, you know, she became artistic fodder. Um, I really felt empathy for her in, in that situation. So, I, I'm, you know, it, it's this, it's Anna, but then I was also, I really felt Jerry stole the show as well. Um, and I know he's not a primary character, but I just, I felt so much empathy for him. I liked him as soon as I saw him interacting with Sarah and giving her him, er, giving her his, his coat. I, I just really, I, I thought, you know, I rooted for him when he was playing Macbeth and I wanted him so much to, to, and then to find out at the end. And, and it was true, you know, they had Henry Breedlove back and, and that was Jerry's finest moment. And, I think was it Ellen who said you you know the the sad part is is that if Jerry goes on stage again tonight he'll realize he never is actually Macbeth King so I I loved Jerry but for me who stole the show this season I would have to say it was Anna so um, I'm kind of going through the corporate ladder because last time it was Richard this time it's Anna um, but um, and it's funny because each season I I, I feel the need to say Jeffrey. Um, because I identify the most with Jeffrey, um, which I find a little disturbing because essentially he talks to dead people, but, uh, but definitely in, in the way he thinks of the theater um, and, and how he kind of processes this information. Um, um, I, I, you know, and I do talk to myself out loud at times. I might as well admit that now. <laughs> so, and on that disturbing note, um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, add, Aaron? Uh, no, I, I'm good. I'm uh, I'm excited to see season three. Uh, King Lear, you said, right? Have you watched season three yet? 
I have not seen season three yet. I'm trying to trying to really pace it out with these podcasts. Ah, well, um, that's interesting then. Okay. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to uh, talking about season three. There are a few things that are definitely um, interesting moments uh, within that and, and kind of the overall arc because season three was intended to be the last season. Hmm, interesting. So they understood, and the fact that it's a Lear play, you know, it's a Shakespearean play that's Lear, um, there's something just kind of very final about it. So it, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on, on season three when we get to that. A little bit of shopkeeping here. Again, this is a four-episode podcast. This is episode two. Uh, the next one will be airing July 26th. Um, and every episode airs uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. And we are looking forward to uh, see episode four because, as you know, the uh, Slings and Arrows is only three episodes. And episode four is going to be a special episode um, where we're going to have some special guests on. And we're going to talk about perhaps the possibility of a season four and, and whether we like that idea or not. Um, we want to hear your feedback and your comments and your thoughts, and we will read them in the podcast. So today is Sunday, and uh, we uh, record every Sunday. So if you can get your thoughts in uh, uh, ah it, between the Thursday when it airs to the Sunday, then uh, then we will uh, we will will be able to read them on on air. You are listening to the Press Plus One uh, podcast of the Slings and Arrows rewatch. So uh, hopefully you will watch season three um, this coming week uh, with the with the two of us and uh, and be ready for the podcast on Thursday. You can find Press Plus One at www.press.com plus numeral one dot com and our twitter and facebook are both the same press plus and numeral one and uh again thank you so much Aaron. did you notice last in the last episode we uh we i i uh i swiped the music for um call the understudy and i did I'm hoping you get the. I really liked the opening credits for uh, season two. I don't know. It's it got really. It, I thought it was better than the first season. It was really stuck in my head this whole time. The Mac, the Macbeth one. Oh, the Macbeth one. You'll never play Macbeth. Yeah. Now I'm gonna have to dig it up now. <laughs> You're welcome. Extra work. <laughs>